Should be not in your yogi. I know what that is. That's the man cat red cross. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shavina, the, the, um, we, we seen a, a error screen. Uh, Shavina, can you unmute yourself just so we can uh, hear you? I should be not in the year. Should be not. Hi, Herod. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, sorry, I just had to change to my laptop because unfortunately the computer um, froze um, and uh, I had to restart it. So I'm just using my laptop. Okay, just, uh, Shabina, just share your screen just so we can test quickly. And um... Sure, no problem. Um, it says that the, there we go. There we go. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, I'm able to see your screen. Um, uh, just remember to put it on presentation mode when you start. Oh, yes, I'll do that. Um, sorry, I just added that. All right, can you, can you see it now? Yeah, that's, that's excellent, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Shabina, I'm gonna um, uh, let the participants in and if it's yeah. on a proper uh, prop, um, uh, I know Shazia has on the so I'm not sure if they just in case she's not on the call. Let me just see that. Let me see the mixes. Am I on? No, no, call. No, no, no. You only have to do this after you do it. Yeah. 
Shavina, we just give him a few more seconds for. Uh, no problem. No problem. Shabina, you're welcome to start. Thank you, Gerrit. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Shabina Frank. I'm one of the ENT registrars um, at the University of Cape Town. And today I'm going to be presenting a, a pediatric case presentation on coanal atresia. Just some disclosures, um, consent was obtained to, to use the patient's details for this presentation. Um, there's no intent for copyright infringement and the content of the presentation is referenced. So looking at our case, we've got baby NR was born at George Hospital. Um, short, shortly after delivery, um, developed severe respiratory distress, um, was suctioned uh, initially and the mucus plug was removed and the infant was also neopuffed for two minutes. Um, subsequent to that, the neonate unfortunately had to go on to CPAP with only very slight improvement in clinical condition, but still had quite severe airway obstruction, often desaturating to as low as 60%. The um, in neonate was eventually um, intubated. Um, unfortunately, they could not intubate nasally, so they intubated orally at George Hospital and the patient was transferred to Red Cross Hospital here in Cape Town. Um, perinatal history, um, this was a normal vaginal delivery um, at 40 weeks, um, APGAS scores were um, 8, 8, at 9, um, at uh, 1, 5 and 8 minutes respectively. Um, there was no um, complications noted during pregnancy and the actual delivery and mom was a preemie gravida with normal booking bloods. On general examination of the neonate, there was no obvious dysmorphic features. Um, with regards to the airway, the uh, infant was orally intubated with a 3.0 millimeter uncuffed ET tube um, and was um, at that stage on very minimal ventilatory supports, um, oxygenating well of SAPs between 98 and 99%. Um, the infant also had a orogastric feeding tube on ear examination um, that was normal. Um, looking at the oral cavity, there was no um, cleft lip or palate. Um, there was no retronathia, no macroglossia, no midfacial hy mid hyperplasia or any obvious craniosynostosis. On anterior rhinoscopy, um, the infant was um, irrigated and decongested and no obvious um, deformities or clips were seen at the anterior nose and um, subsequently the neonate had a flexible nasal endoscopy um, which showed bilateral atretic plate um, posteriorly. So looking at the potential differential diagnosis, um, this was taken from Scott Brown um, and divides congenital causes for nasal obstruction in neonates into atomic, an, anatomical or skeletal um, anomalies congenital nasal cysts um, and nasal masses. So the investigations done for this um, a neonate, uh, a CT scan of the paranasal sinuses was requested. Uh, a charge workup was done, um, which involved an, uh, a cardiac echo, which was normal, a KUB ultrasound, which was also normal. And uh, the infant also had a hearing screen, um, which showed bilateral um, OAE that was a pass. 
So this um, is one of the uh, images from the CT um, that we did. Um, this is an axial view, um, um, it's a bony view. Um, and I hope this comes out. Um, you can see um, the blue arrows indicates a um, meniscus, um, which is um, usually seen in uh, uh, these patients with coanal atresia. Um, and it basically um, demonstrates um, holdup of nasal secretions and mucus um, within the nasal cavity um, at the level of the obstruction. Sorry, I, importantly uh, to note, these patients um, should be uh, decongested at least 30 minutes before the, the scan is done and directly before the scan is done should be suctioned well um, in order to uh, uh, demonstrate accurately um, uh, uh, this type of abnormality. The red arrows indicate um, uh, medialization and medial thickening of the uh, medial pterygoid plates um, and uh, the green arrow just demonstrates um, vomer thickening and this is um, bilateral. Um, this is a coronal view um, and this just um, demonstrates um, vomer thickening um, and then a sagittal um, uh, view shows uh, the membranous um, obstruction at the uh, posterior nasal cavity. So a diagnosis of mixed uh, bony and membranous uh, bilateral coanal atresia was made and the decision of surgical repair um, was made um, and done at day eight of life. So this was done via a transnasal endoscopic approach um, where we um, opened up the uh, atritic plates through anterior and posterior based uh, septal flaps and a through biter was used to remove uh, the redundant mucosa. Um, at the same sitting, a posterior septectomy was done uh, and the flap um, was draped over the posterior edge of the bony septum. Um, the patient was then taken to ICU, and, and this is our protocol that um, we use at uh, Red Cross for these patients. Um, They're extubated in ICU and initially put on nasal CPAP. And then for the first 48 hours um, post-surgery, um, they require um, regular uh, frequent um, nasal irrigation, as well as um, nasal suctioning with a suction catheter um, and, and um, they also require um, decongestion um, using iliadin um, or oxymetazoline drops um, as well as FML uh, liquid. With our case, um, unfortunately, this infant um, required uh, a further three revision procedures. Um, the second one was about three weeks after the, the first repair um, and that was really um, uh, for unilateral restenosis on the left-hand side and then just removal of some granulation tissue um, on, the, uh, on the right side. Um, the following two revisions then were done um, over a course of eight months um, following the initial presentation um, and that the indication for that those two um, procedures were bilateral restenosis um, um, of the soft tissue. Um, currently, there has been no further recent admissions noted for this infant for respiratory distress or low respiratory tract infection, um, and they are due for um, follow-up um, with us and repeat uh, nasal endoscopy. So coenal atresia, the definition is that is an, it is an anatomical closure of the posterior coena in the nasal cavity. Um, it's quite a rare condition, and one in every 5,000 to 8,000 births are reported and females are twice as likely um, uh, to be affected um, as their male counterparts. 29% um, of these atresias are pure bony atresias with 71% being mixed membranous and bony atresia. Recent reviews um, in the literature have failed to show uh, and or demonstrate any pure membranous atresias. 65 to 75% um, of Coenal atresias are unilateral um, and 
to note 75% of bilateral cases often have other congenital anomalies. So just briefly looking at the embryology, um, at third week gestation, the nasal placards appear. During the fifth week of gestation, these placards invaginate into pits, uh, which extend posteriorly to form the uh, nasal cavity, um, which is separated from the oral cavity by a buccal nasal membrane. There are two limbs of mesenchymal elevation that surround these nasal pits um, to form the nasomedial and nasolateral processes of the nose. Uh, the nasal cavity is then further lengthened um, and at this stage communicates with the upper pharynx um, until the fusion of the uh, palatal shells. During the fifth to sixth week, week of gestation, uh, the buccal uh, nasal membrane uh, breaks down to form the posterior coena. Um, there is, um, the nose is occluded with an epithelial plug um, at this stage um, until the 24th week of gestation when the plug resorbs. So looking at the pathogenesis, um, there are four theories that have been quoted in the literature. The first being the persistence of this buccopharyngeal membrane from the foregut. Uh, the second one being an abnormal persistence or location of mesoderm that surround these um, nasal pits forming adhesions in the nasocoanal region. Um, abnormal persistence of the nasobuccal membrane of Hochstetter. And then the more popular theory is misdirection of neural crest cell migration. Um, in recent literature, um, two other maternal factors um, have been um, theorized. The first one being uh, retinoic acid deficiency. Um, this is thought to be um, results in um, a uh, overexpression of certain um, growth factors uh, uh, and that result in persistence of um, nasal fins um, within the uh, nasal cavity, which results in um, coanal atresia. This theory has been demonstrated in mice studies, um, but uh, currently in the literature, there's no um, human studies uh, um, that have demonstrated this theory. Um, th and the second one is um, with regards to medications, uh, specifically thioamides that are used um, in patients with um, hyperthyroidism. Um, there have been a few uh, case series, uh, sorry, case studies um, that have shown a potential correlation between using these medications um, uh, during pregnancy and the formation of coanal atresia. Looking at the clinical features, there are four parts uh, to this anatomical uh, abnormality. First one being narrow, a narrow nasal cavity. Uh, then there's lateral bony obstruction with medial thickening of the medial pterygoid plate and medial obstruction with lateral thickening of the vomer um, and also membranous um, obstruction. Patients can present either bilateral canal atresia or unilateral. Looking at bilateral um, presentation, this is often a neonatal emergency as with our case. These patients often have breathing difficulties, chest retraction and cyanosis. Um, and the cyanosis has a typical history um, where the cyanosis worsens at rest um, and feeding and is often relieved by crying um, or mouth opening. They may also present with a history of multiple failed extubation attempts, especially in those neonates with other <clears throat> secondary airway uh, issues. Patients who present with unilateral um, uh, coenal atresia, often they are asymptomatic at birth and only really represent later on in life. And they often represent with uh, uh, chronic uni unilateral nasal obstruction. Uh, persistent mucoid uh, rhinorrhea or a history of chronic sinusitis. As I said before, 75% of uh, bilateral nasal coenal atresia often have other congenital anomalies. It's important to note that these neonates often present more acutely with more severe respiratory symptoms and often require stable alternative airway management, such as a tracheostomy, in addition to other a surgical correction.
This is just a brief list um, of the potential uh, congenital anomalies associated with coanal atresia. By far the most common is um, being charge syndrome. Just looking at charge syndrome, um, this is a, a syndrome with a group of a collection of um, congenital abnormalities, um, coanal atresia being one of them. So just going through the list, um, first uh, potential um, malformation is coloboma of the um, eye. It's seen in 75 to 90% of patients that have charge syndrome. Um, heart defects are also quite common in 75 to 80%. Um, TOF, uh, PDA, VSD, and ASD being the most common lesions. As I said, coenal atresia is also quite common in 50 to 60% of these infants. It's usually bilateral. And importantly to note, there's a high mortality of these infants um, when it's in combination with heart defects. Uh, retarded growth and development is also seen and 70% of these patients have an IQ of less than 70. There are also genitourinary um, abnormalities in about 50 to 70% of these patients, genital hypoplasia being the most common um, and most commonly seen in males. And there are also yeah, abnormalities in about 80 to 100% of these patients with charge syndrome. These include um, cup or lop shaped pinna, osticular defects, absence of semicircular canals, um, Mondini defects of the cochlea, these patients can also have hearing loss that can be conductive or mixed. So what can you do at the bedside to make this diagnosis? Um, it's important that these patients are adequately decongested and suctioned um, and uh, anterior rhinoscopy can be done. And this is really just to look for any other congenital um, abnormalities within the anterior uh, nasal cavity. Introduction of a size six or eight French suction catheter by the nostrils can also be done. And usually we say that if, if, you're, if you're unable to pass one more than 5.5 centimeters from the ALR rim, um, this is potentially um, a sign for uh, coanal atresia or stenosis. Methylene blue dye test can also be done where the dye is squirted into the nasal um, cavity and uh, the dye is, um, should be detected within the nasopharynx. A cotton wisp test can also be done and this is uh, at the nostril. This is looking just for airflow through the nostril, both on the right and the left side. Uh, laryngeal mirror test can also be done at the nostril looking for misting. Um, and then flexible nasal endoscopy um, and direct visualization um, of the nasal cavity after suctioning is used for definitive diagnosis. So imaging that can be done um, if you don't have a CT scan available, uh, a lateral skull x-ray can be done and usually the nose is filled with a radio, um, radio opaque dye. Um, and as you can see in this photo on the uh, right hand side, um, the blue arrow indicates a uh, holdup of the dye within the posterior nasal cavity. Um, I've turned the image um, straight up, but this patient is actually lying supine. So the CT uh, um, of the paranasal sinuses is the gold standard to confirm the diagnosis. Um, it's used also to uh, establish whether it's unilateral or bilateral coenal atresia to evaluate the coenal atresia um, to assess if it's bony, mixed, or membranous, to exclude other potential uh, differentials, and to evaluate for any other associated anomalies, especially in those children um, who uh, have dysmorphic features. Other investigations that should be um, complementary to your um, management is the ultrasound um, KUB, an echo, audiology review, um, ophthalmology and those uh, children who do have potentially other congenital abnormalities, uh, genetics um, sh um, should be reviewed. So the initial airway management of these patients is really particularly speaks about bilateral acranial atresia as this 
often represents as an airway emergency as uh, the neonate is an obligate nasal breather um, until the age of about up to six weeks. So McGovern nipples can be used standard feeding bottle teat or even a dummy with a tip cut off placed in the oral cavity to stent the oral cavity and allow for oral breathing um, can, be, can be used. A Gadal oral pharyngeal airway can also be used. Um, and if these um, fail, endotracheal um, intubation. Tracheostomy is usually reserved for those patients who have other severe congenital abnormalities being heart defects or, or other, um, um, uh, other laryngeal abnormalities. So the principles of surgical management um, is to adequately provide a functional coenal patency um, to prevent low rates of restenosis, to avoid harm to any structures still in development, for shorter surgery and hospital times, and to minimize morbidity and mortality in these infants. There are multiple surgical approaches that have been described in the literature, um, with, together with the use um, of, of stenting. These are nasal, uh, transnasal, which can be done with the microscope or endoscopic, transpalatal and transeptal. So I'll briefly just um, mention um, a little bit about each of these and their advantages and disadvantages. So transnasal puncture, uh, this is a blind perforation that is made usually with a curved trocar curette or urethral sound. Often a finger is placed, inserted through the mouth to protect the skull base and progressively larger dilators are used to enlarge the opening. The disadvantages of this um, approach is that uh, you cannot see the full operator field. You are unable to resect the posterior vomer and the, in the literature, they note a high recurrence of restenosis. There are also multiple complications that come with this type of approach, these being septal um, and also turbinate injury, intranasal adhesions, clival injury, CSF leak, and the potential for meningitis um, from penetration or fracture of the uh, perpendicular plate or cribriform plate of the ethmoids. Recently, um, a retropalatal endoscopic approach has been um, um, shown in the literature. Here you use a 120 degree endoscope to view the nasopharyngeal side of the atritic plate and you introduce the, in, the instruments through the, the nasal cavity. This is quite a useful approach in those uh, neonates where the nasal cavity is quite small and unable to fit both an endoscope and an instrument. Transnasal drill out. This approach is done through the nasal vestibule and the microscope is used. Uh, the mucosal fat is, um, covering the atritic plate is excised and elevated and the posterior voma atritic plate and medial pterobed lamina are exposed. The cone is opened um, in its inferior medial border and widened as much as possible using a drill. The posterior vomit can also be resected at this stage and the flaps are drawn posteriorly um, and stents can be inserted. The limitations, however, of this um, approach with the microscope is that if you have a deviated nasal septum or hypertrophic conca, it often obscures the visual, the surgical field. Transeptal approach, this is mainly used for unilateral atresia um, and an anterior septal incision is made the mucopericondium flap is raised and it's raised over a few structures, the cartilaginous and bony septal septum, the nasal cavity wall and the atritic plate, and this creates a blind pouch. The septum is then released from the maxillary crest and the atritic plate and posterior um, voma are excised. The flap is then laid back into position and a cruciate incision is made to open the coena. The stent can be used um, and inserted at this stage. The advantages of this um, approach is that there's minimal trauma to the nasal mucosa and if there is a septal deviation this can be corrected um, at the same sitting. The drawbacks however is that there can be inhibition of nasal development and uh, it isn't, uh, isn't not an optimized um, field of view. The transpalatal approach this is often kept for older children 
where the tritic plate, uh, the bony um, um, portion is quite thick. So a U-shaped incision is made along the alveolar arch and the mucosal flap is raised, avoiding the greater palatine vessels. <clears throat> The hard palate is opened and the achetic plate is exposed um, and resected along with the posterior vomer. Um, the preserved mucosa um, that was lifted can be then rotated back to cover the bony surfaces. So the advantages of this approach is that it gives you excellent visualization. It is a safe and complete resection of the achetic plate and there is controlled resection of the posterior vomer. The drawbacks, however, are that it does interfere with palatal growth um, and it can interfere with maxillary development um, resulting in a crossbite. Um, in the literature the complications described are palatal fistula flap breakdown and often these patients have delayed feeding. So the most popular one used um, today is the transnasal endoscopic approach using a um, zero degree scope the atritic plate is opened in its inferior um, medial portion and enlarged um, either with a micro debrider, a backbiter, or a circular sphenoid punch. Drill can be used um, also at, in this approach for bony resection, and the posterior vomer is resected using a backbiter. The advantages of this approach is that you get a good visual field with the endoscope. There's no interference with the mid palatal suture or septum. Uh, the nasal mucosa can be reserved and there isn't a limitation uh, regarding age. Looking at stents, um, stenting is done at the surgeon's preference and there are multiple materials that can be used. You can use a modified portex tube, silastic sheets, foam rubber, polyethylene tubes, Vaseline gauze, hard rubber, and in recent literature, steroid eluting stents often reserved for bilateral cases. Um, there's no uh, standardized length of duration that these stents are left in. Most of the literature quotes six to 12 weeks and uh, stents are often reserved for revision surgery and often have to be kept in for, for longer than 12 weeks. So when approach, approaching this patient, um, there are some considerations that uh, uh, need to be looked at one, the timing of the surgery, the surgical approach, and whether to stent these patients or not. So looking at the literature with regards to the timing of surgery, this was a systematic review uh, done in 2019, looking at immediate versus delayed surgery. Uh, 23 studies met the inclusion criteria and the outcomes were measured with regards to primary treatment failure, respiratory function and mortality rates. The conclusions in, in this systematic review showed that primary treatment failure for bilateral coronal atresia, you can see that in the immediate group was only 24.8%, whereas in the delayed group, it was 42.6%. They also go on to say that there was no difference in mortality rates for the bilateral coronal atresia. There was no difference in outcomes for unilateral coronal atresia whether you do it immediately or delayed. And the final conclusion in this paper was that there were significantly higher rates of failure um, with delayed surgery for bilateral cranial atresia. When looking at the surgical approach, um, the, the literature um, shows the, the, there's two studies that um, I looked at. One was uh, a, a Cochrane review where they uh, looked at 120 studies. Uh, unfortunately, none of these studies met their inclusion criteria. Um, and the conclusion for this paper was that there was no definitive evidence based on adequate studies to demonstrate the potential advantages or disadvantages of any one specific surgical technique. In another meta-analysis uh, in 2016, this specifically specific analysis um, compared transnasal and transpalatal approaches um, with regards to restenosis. Um, they also looked um, at comparing the use of metamycin C and stenting um, post repair with regards to, to restenosis. 410 cases were found. Um, there was no statistical difference 
a significant difference between transnasal endoscopic and transpalatal approach. And then I also go on to mention that there was no statistical uh, significant difference between using intraoperative topical vitamicin C and nasal stenting. So looking at nasal stenting, um, this was another um, review um, where 154 um, studies were identified, only 15 met the inclusion criteria. The level of evidence varied from three to four and successful surgery was defined as the absence of restenosis. And as you can see, the success rates between the patients that were stented and were not stented, um, there was no difference. 65% versus 64% respectively. They do mention, however, that the use of stents is associated with um, potential complications, these being ALAR injury, columella tear, vestibular stenosis, and the stent can also be dislodged or, or blocked. Another study um, that I had a look at was um, that looked at predictive factors for surgical outcomes for these patients. Um, this was a retrospective study where 80 patients aged three days to 17 years were um, included. And their, um, their conclusions were that associated anomalies and previous surgery had no effect on surgical outcome. However, uh, the presence of gastroesophageal reflux disease, patients who were younger than 10 days of age at the time of surgery and insufficient post-operative endoscopic revision did have a significant outcome uh, I, I did have a significant um, uh, outcome um, for these patients. So the International Pediatric Otolaryngology Group decided um, to do a consensus where they approached 22 members um, um, who worked at about Sorry, uh, there was 28 members that worked at 22 tertiary hospitals across eight countries. And the survey was done to look at um, how these um, centers uh, diagnosed these patients, what were their uh, preoperative um, um, considerations, what was their operative approach, and what were their postoperative management um, uh, protocols for these patients. Um, and this is a paper that they released um, from that um, survey um, where they provided management algorithms um, for these patients looking at unilateral coronal atresia, bilateral coronal atresia, and post-operative decision making. Um, some of the highlights from this particular paper was that the diagnosis um, is made by a combination of endoscopy and CT scanning. Unilateral coronal atresia repair should be delayed after at least um, at the age of six months or older, if possible. Uh, transnasal endoscopic repair is the preferred technique for both bilateral and unilateral coronal atresia. And they recommend that long-term follow-up should be at least a minimum of one year um, using uh, a nasal endoscopy um, and that uh, systematic imaging did not need to be done in, in these patients. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, thanks for that, Shalina. Uh, we, we don't see any um, questions on the chest function um, yet. Uh, perhaps Dr. McGuire can, can comment on, uh, uh, on, on, on this uh, lecture. Um, thanks, Shavina. I think that was an excellent and very comprehensive talk. Uh, I've got a couple of things to say. Um, I mean, I've, I've been doing these surgeries for four years now, and uh, we've had quite a lot of, uh, and, and I started off and Initially, uh, the preferred technique uh, at our institution was dilation with the drill out. Um, and uh, and it sort of at that time felt like um, it would be, the, uh, the space would be too small to lift a flap. But we did have quite high rates of uh, restenosis and uh, our preferred technique now is to do bilateral septal flaps and um, 
uh, uh, raise the flaps and uh, remove the posterior part of the VOMA or the whole VOMA, depending on um, how stenotic it is, and then uh, lay the flaps over uh, the posterior septum. And then we use a mushroom punch to uh, bite away the soft tissue and the bone uh, uh, superiorly and laterally by the medial uh, pterygoid. The, um, and, and these children have, I find, much better outcomes. Uh, the, they still nose up post-operatively, um, occasionally, but this is soft tissue um, stenosis. And I don't think that you can consider it a failure to take the children back to theater. I think you can't really predict how these children are gonna heal. And it's such a small airway to start with that um, what we found is that very frequently you do the operation, you need to take them back within three weeks, but then subsequently to that, you only need to take them back perhaps uh, six months down the line. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 saw, I, I thought, so I see uh, Shavina said that uh, one of the studies said that, uh, you know, uh, reserve tracheostomy for patients who have cardiac defects. And I actually think in those patients, uh, as long as they're clinically stable, I, I, I would prefer to do the surgery. And the reason is, is that if you do a tracheostomy, Sometimes that complicates the cardiac surgery because uh, there's a, start, a chance of sternal sepsis. So, so we would try and do the surgery, particularly in children who have uh, concurrent um, congenital problems, because you want to try and avert a tracheostomy if you can in those children. Um, the other thing that I, I, I noticed is, um, you know, uh, whether you want to stent or not stent. And we've tried both. And one of the things that they didn't mention in Shabina's paper uh, that she uh, commented on is that you can sometimes get septal perforations from uh, stenting. And these are anterior, well, in our case, we had an anterior perforation. And um, it was asymptomatic in that child at that time. But because of it, we, we don't like to stent anymore uh, because anterior perforations are more likely to be symptomatic than posterior perforations. Um, we've also seen complications from hospitals who have referred patients to us with drilling. And uh, if you are going to use the drill, you need to be very cautious that you don't injure the nasal ala uh, because you can get stenosis of the nasal ala and that's incredibly difficult to treat. And it does result in um, uh, um, hyperplasia of that ala and asymmetry of the face. And I think that's quite a serious outcome in those children. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to comment on. I'm trying to think now. Um, oh, uh, quite significantly, I think it's important to look at children who have coronal atresia in, uh, with comorbidities. And so I agree. I don't think that age or size, I mean, I think size is not an indication not to do the surgery. We've done uh, coronal atresia repairs in children as small as 1.8 kilograms, and we've had good outcomes. I think in children who have significant comorbidities, like one of our children has a, um, a connective tissue uh, um, problem. And that child has scarred up very badly. And retrospectively, I think that in children who particularly have connective tissue problems and maybe have bad healing, uh, I would prefer to do a tracheostomy and operate on them when they're much bigger, when there's more space and you can see better and uh, you know, there's just uh, more room for definitive surgery because the complications of uh, um, posterior nasal uh, stenosis is, is severe. Uh, when, uh, in Shavina's talk where she mentioned that patients who have delayed surgery compared to uh, immediate surgery and whether uh, that the patients who had delayed surgery had poorer outcomes, I, I don't think that's a fair paper. And the reason is, is because maybe the patients who had delayed surgery had, had significant 
uh, morbidities or comorbidities and that might have affected their healing. And so maybe it was just um, bias in the paper. But I mean, you're just opening up the post-nasal space. I can't imagine whether you do it immediately or delayed uh, would have an outcome except for patient factors that might affect healing. Um, yeah, so I think, that I, I, I can't remember what else I was going to say, but I, I, um, I don't know, does anybody else have anything to add to the discussion? Is Darlene there? Uh, th thanks so much, Jessica. That was a very comprehensive agenda. Thank you. And um, uh, Prof. Shazia has a raised hand. Uh, Shazia, I'm not sure if you want to add anything. I, I, I think it's sorted now. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Karen. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Jess. I think it was quite important for you to be present for this. So thank you for adding all of that. I just have a few comments. The first thing is, um, thanks, Javina, for bringing this um, topic up. My concern is that obviously the IPAR guidelines are the most recent. So it's probably the best place to start. And it, it's comprehensive enough that the consensus guidelines look at all of the uh, previous papers. So it summarizes it quite nicely. I highly recommend those people going for exams to look at the IPOG consensus guidelines that Eric Moredu did. Um, I think one of the big things that I found to be quite important for me was, what is the definition of restenosis? What is the percentage of restenosis? And what do we do about it? And that's something that we keep talking about. And as Jessica said, do we see it as a failure or not? And for someone who goes to theater for airways for surveillance scopes and for reviews, I see the coena and the coenal drill out as an airway surveillance and airway assessment. And for the most part, we can put in a 2.7 millimeter telescope, a rigid or a flexible in the clinic and have a look. But these are kids who are tiny, who are wriggling around and growing and doing all sorts of things. So the best thing to, to do is to assess them under a general anesthesia that takes five or 10 minutes, but allows you to look um, extremely well at the back of the nose and to dilate or to nibble away or to remove granulation tissue at the same time. The indication to go to theater in the first few weeks after surgery should be low because you've just lifted flaps, you've just put down flaps, people are suctioning blindly, mums may not be sure how to irrigate. So to assess someone in theater does not mean going to theater is seen as a failure. Number one, number two, restenosis is up to 82%. What do we consider to be restenosis is any size once it has been opened that reduces by 30%. That's quite, you know, that's quite a big amount. And so a lot of children will re -stenose. It doesn't mean they have airway obstruction or that they can't feed. So we can even allow a degree of re even on the one side, because as Jessica says, it's soft tissue, but as long as they don't fail to thrive, in which case, if they do come back and see us, we can dilate them or widen it at a later stage. So follow-up, especially for patients who live far away, and taking them to theater earlier is necessary. So we see each patient as with its own merit based on their social circumstances on how soon we see them and how soon we take them to theater. So that must be borne in mind for any, any patient, any person who's doing sinus uh, coenal atresia drill outs. The other thing I want to mention is that I think above, you know, your, the management plan is about con the type of surgery and what approach and all of that is the first first step of all principles of neonatal pathology in any child is, do we have an established airway and do we need to establish some kind of definitive airway before addressing the pathology? And that's where we need to start. And that's how we address any pediatric patient, pediatric airway patient, wherever the level of pathology is. Because some kids who have mid-face pathology may have tracheal sleeves or tracheal pathology. And some kids may have anatomical presentations that are not amenable to surgical repair. Like Jessica mentioned, the, the cardiac anomaly or the cardiac pathology may require severe corrective repair, in which case you may have to use an alternative 
uh, definitive airway other than a trachea to avoid the mediastinitis and and um, and, um, and and any um, soft tissue sepsis. But at the same time, if it's not a corrective cardiac surgery, for example, a band or a shunt then you might as well put in the trachea and come back later and watch them grow. Because if you have congenital anomalies that are anatomical, there's a chance that the skull base may be lower, that the actual nasal cavities may also be abnormal, that their palate may heal poorly. So each child must be seen in its individual merit. As much as we see so many of these, they are quite rare. And so each child's decision-making must be specific and putting in a trachea doesn't go without merit, but also doing the surgery at the right time and knowing that you're coming back in a few weeks or coming back in a few months is not a sign of failure. So I think those things must be borne in mind. Sorry that I spoke so long. Jess, maybe you thought of what you wanted to say. Maybe you can add to it. Yeah, uh, the one thing was, uh, it's actually surprising how many of these children actually have <clears throat> other problems in the nose. And uh, children who have associated nasal stenosis it makes the surgery significantly more difficult there's just not room to place all your instruments in and um and often if you open up the uh, the coroner and those children um they still don't have an adequate airway so it's important on the ct scan when you're looking at the ct scan to assess the nasal cavities as well and see whether there's associated nasal cavity stenosis. And the easiest way to do this is to look where the sort of, there's like nasal crowding. And we've managed to treat these children. Um, it's, the surgery is very frustrating, but if you do a, a turbinectomy, an inferior turbinectomy on the one side, it seems to help the airway a bit. Thanks. Those comments were, were very valuable. Um, and thanks, uh, Jessica and Shazia. Uh, I don't see any um, uh, other comments on the chat function, um, and I don't see any raised hands. Um, perhaps uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see Kafui on, on the line. Um, Kafui is a, a, a previous uh, rhinology fellow um, uh, from Cape Town. And Kafui, perhaps you can comment on uh, if you're doing any cranial atresia surgery in, uh, in Ghana. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, so um, over the past two years in Ghana, we've done a total of six cases down here, uh, which we've repaired all of them endoscopically um, we had um, uh, four of them being bilateral and two being unilateral. And most of our patients have been diagnosed within uh, eight, eight, weeks of, eight weeks of birth. And uh, I must say, um, it's been only one of them had the cardiac anomaly that was uh, uh, just the 26 day old baby who had a cardiac anomaly. Uh, currently, we've not seen any of them with risk stenosis. Uh, we raise the bilateral flaps, take down the pterygoid process, like you said. And then uh, what I try to do is to get the flaps cover the bony surfaces very well, uh, together with the posterior septectomy that we do. Uh, having heard from Shazia now, maybe my threshold for re-examining some of these patients under a general anesthesia uh, is something I'll consider. We tend to use the flexible endoscope uh, quite a lot uh, for the re-evaluation when they present for review. So instead of using the rigid, sometimes just use the flexible and see to what extent uh, we've had any re stenosis. For all these patients, I've not had to pass any stent for any of them. And um, currently, I'm able to follow up on five of them, but one has been lost to follow up. Um, those are my brief comments that I would make on this. Uh, I don't know whether there's a chance of combining data from down here and what we have in Cape Town uh, to serve as maybe a baseline for Africa. Maybe, probably our, our, our healing and other things may also be different here. Those are my comments, Gary. Thanks for the opportunity.
Oh, thanks, Godfrey. Good really hearing from you. I'm sure you can uh, speak to Jessica, and then there's probably a study on the way there. Um, I don't know if there's any other comments from questions from anyone. Okay, I'm uh, just uh, with regards to the young IFOS meeting. Uh, uh, Louisa would just like to um, uh, add a, a Things. Good morning, everyone. It's just a reminder that next week, Wednesday, Wednesday evening, we've got our second Young IFOS uh, virtual ENT webinar. And the last one was very well attended with more than 180 participants. Um, for this next webinar on Wednesday evening, we've got Dr. Zara Patel from Stanford University who's joining us, Associate Professor. And we've also got uh, Dr. Frank Renesa from um, Spain who'll be joining us um, also for that talk as well as some other uh, special guests like Dr. Samuel Okorosi, um, and obviously we'll have Prof. Pierre and um, Dr. Simon, which is the Vice Chair of the Young IFO. So we look forward to seeing you next week, Wednesday evening. Thanks, Louisa. Um, there's no more comments or raised hands. Uh, I hope everyone has a, has a great weekend and I'll end the meeting. Thanks.